everybody. Welcome to uh, another episode, another instance of our uh, of our great live streams. And today we have uh, some special guests lined up for you. Of course, with a quick sneak peek, as always, at what's coming up uh, on next Tuesday, where our great discussions, uh, sorry, our great decision series is going to look at China's role in Africa. And that's with Ambassador Marcus Quino, who of course served in Equatorial Guinea uh, in Africa, which is a fascinating place. And I know he has lots of stories to share about what China has been up to on the continent. Uh, then on Wednesday, the 24th, we have our special Russia disruption series kicking off. This is, of course is a partnership with the Phoenix Council on Foreign Relations and the Malikian Center at Arizona State University. We have some spectacular speakers lined up to give us a real inside look uh, at what is going on in Russia today, especially with uh, what's happening with the opposition. One of our speakers is a uh, uh, the leader of the New Times uh, paper in Moscow, which is an opposition paper, and she's about to head back there. And I can't imagine a more difficult job. Um, it's one of the more difficult jobs, let's say, on the planet, one of the more dangerous ones. So she'll be sharing thoughts with us. That's on Wednesday the 24th. And then on Thursday the 25th, we're going to revisit a great topic and, and one that we've explored in different angles uh, through our Journalism Under Fire conference. And this is looking at local journalism and the role that, that local journalism plays in democracy. We'll also go abroad with that as one of the speakers was actually uh, deported from Myanmar for uh, training local journalists there in 2009. So she'll share some of her stories on that. Um, and beyond all of that, we have all kinds of things going on uh, in this crazy live stream world. We're about to announce our annual gala as well, which I hope you'll join us for. We have a major speaker confirmed for that, but I'm just gonna hold on to those details until we're 100% sure that everything's gonna flow the way it needs to flow. So let me now bring in today's speakers. And I'm gonna start by observing that one of our speakers, Davey Aguilera, was unable to join us today because he's in Texas and he is, uh, deep within uh, is without any power whatsoever. And so regrettably, we're not going to be able to feature Davey um, and, and his many thoughts on weapons. Uh, however, we do have a couple of, of experts here who will help us uh, navigate that terrain without Davey present. Um, so let me start by introducing one of my favorite speakers on the CIR stage, Mike V. Hill. Good morning, Mike. How are you? Good, Sammy. How are you? It's a pleasure to be with you today. Yeah, thank you for joining us yet again. I'm just going to read Mike's bio really quickly. Mike, of course, is a 31-year veteran of the Drug Enforcement Administration, was a member of the Senior Executive Service, served as a special agent in charge of the DEA's Caribbean and San Diego divisions. He was also the Chief of International Operations, responsible for all offices worldwide, which included Latin America, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Central Asia, and Southeast Asia. Quite a portfolio, Mike. We'll come back to you in just a second. Um, let me introduce now really quickly uh, our, today's other speaker, which is Alvin Romero. Good morning, Alvin. It's great to see you. How are you? Good, very good. Good. So Alvin, I'm just going to read your bio really quickly, and then I'm going to toss a couple questions to you. So Alvin is a retired IRS criminal investigation special agent who specialized as an undercover operative in money laundering and in financial tax fraud and tax evasion federal e investigations. Again, I can't imagine uh, the many things that you saw in your career. And Alvin, I think, why don't we just kick off with you telling us a little bit more about your background and the kinds of work that you did and, uh, and, and just help us understand kind of where you're coming from in all of this. Okay, uh, my personal background real quick and then I'll get on the professional side. Uh, I, uh, I'm a Velarde native, north of Santa Fe. I graduated from Española High School in 1969. I also graduated from uh, New Mexico State University. Mike and I were roommates down there for one, a couple of semesters at the end. I graduated in 1974 and then uh, worked at the State Auditor's Office for a couple of years, New Mexico State Auditor's Office. But I got picked up by IRS Criminal Investigations in 1977, graduated from the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in 1977. and. I, that's when I never in my life did I think that I would go into law enforcement when I was taking those accounting courses. But I found out through Mike, as he was working here in Albuquerque, he told me, guess what? I'm working with some IRS agents in accounting. And it really sounded good. He told me that uh, 20 year retirement, he told me something like that. And I thought, what? 
And he said, you ought to, you ought to apply. And I did. And I, it took three years because they had just done a, mass, a massive hire when I first came in. But I finally got, uh, came in and uh, I landed up doing that uh, work for 25 years, just a little over 25 years. Uh, federal agents, there's a mandatory retirement for those of you that don't know if you carry a firearm at the age of 57. I was 52 at the time that I retired only because Bill Richardson called me and asked me if I was interested in beginning as somewhat of an IRS criminal enforcement arm at the state level. And he had heard that uh, my name kept coming up when he was thinking about doing that. And he said that he had heard I was eligible to retire. And I told him, somebody's giving you good information. And that's how I left IRS after 25 years. And I landed up doing that job for Bill Richardson for eight years. Of course, when the new governor comes in, they throw everybody out basically. Uh, Susana Martinez asked me to stick around. I was one of the 20 that, out of 360 that I was asked to stick around. And I did that for six years. When I really retired, retired, uh, my wife got a job in Washington, D.C., and I moved up that way. So that's my career. I'm a certified public accountant since 1985. I keep my license up. Uh, I have to take 40 hours of CPE annually to keep that license up, but I'm still a certified public accountant. I do consulting work uh, uh, at times, uh, less often now. I, I'm enjoying, um, I turned 70 this coming year, so I'm, I'm enjoying my free time and hopefully I don't get too many jobs. I, I'm not gonna get too many jobs, that's for sure. And uh, I did do undercover work for 15 years of my time. Uh, and primarily uh, we had about 80 undercover agents out of the 3000 IRS agents. Of those 80, about 60 of them were, were Spanish speakers. And so those Spanish speakers did about 90% of the undercover operations because the majority of them were really working with drugs and Spanish speaking. And, and so uh, uh, someone that wasn't a Spanish speaker, probably uh, from a Mexican background or a Puerto Rican background was probably not gonna do well in the, that kind of a role. So that's what I did. Uh, later on, we can talk about one of the cases that I think the, uh, you will find interesting. Excellent. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And you know what? Why don't we just dive into that story right now, if you don't mind? We were just talking about this before coming on air. You know, I didn't realize that IRS had undercover agents, let alone undercover agents working on, uh, you know, on drug issues in particular. Will you tell us, Alvin, just really quickly, the story uh, involving, uh, you know, your undercover work in Colorado? Yeah, sure. Uh, pretty much all the cases that I did, and I probably did 30 or 40 undercover operations. None of them, not all of them were successful. Sometimes uh, some of the agents overstated their case when they called me in. And I, I never did an undercover operation in the state of New Mexico. I was a president of the New Mexico Association of Hispanic CPAs. Uh, my picture come out on the newspaper sometimes. So somebody might recognize me. So I always did work out of state. This particular one, I did a lot of work in Miami, San Diego, Washington, DC, New York. Kokomo, Indiana, for example, 26 states that I went to that I would have probably never traveled had I not got into, into the undercover cadre. But this particular case was up in Denver. It was in 1989, December, the biggest cocaine dealer in the state of Colorado at that time. He was bringing in allegedly $50 million worth of cocaine into Colorado, Denver. This guy was a 26 year old. I'll share his name because it's a public information. His name was Jesus Galindo, and uh, he was from Mexico. I met him through my alleged girlfriend, who was another federal agent. Uh, she went and bought some cocaine from him, uh, not a lot, just enough to get a conversation. This guy owned a bar named El Papagayo, which man, means King Cock. Big old red rooster on top of the bar. So he thought he was King Cock, I guess. But uh, so anyway, uh, in talking with her and probably trying to pick up on her, she was an attractive lady. Uh, he, he kept uh, wanting to see her again and again, but he told her, you know, selling the cocaine is not, the product is not so difficult for me. I have plenty of runners here in Colorado. Uh, my biggest problem is getting the money back to Mexico. 
Now, keep in mind, 1989, there's a lot of more vehicles today to get those monies uh, to Mexico or anywhere in the world, or maybe not even take it to Mexico, but buy, buy businesses in the United States, for example. But that wasn't 1989. The mindset was get the money back before I come from, to my family, etc. So uh, she said, you know what? I have a boyfriend. Basically, I was supposed to be a professional money launderer from Los Angeles. So I flew in with a pinstripe suit. I had a, remember I, they gave me a Rolex watch that they had taken off a Mexican individual and it had uh, the flag of Mexico, really the rubies, diamonds and emeralds, the, the color of the flag of Mexico. You really uh, got enamored with that Rolex watch when we were talking. And uh, so anyway, uh, basically uh, this, I met with him two times. The second time he gave me a quarter of a million dollars in a suitcase. We counted it in my room. It took us about three hours to count, count it. We did it by hand. Uh, sometimes I had a money machine uh, that would count it, the money. But this particular time, uh, the people in Denver told me, let's do it by hand. By the time I finished counting the three hours of counting, after drinking a few beers, they thought that you're a cop who won't drink a beer on the job. So I ordered beers on purpose and offered them some beers so they don't think I'm a cop. So then he did say if he found out I was a cop, I would, he would kill me. I also told him, if I find out you're a cop, I'll kill you too. So we kind of, we were a stalemate there, but I counted the money and by the time I finished counting the money, my fingers, the thumbs and these two, they were black, black. I could have probably gotten a knife and peeled off that black, like almost like paper. And money is dirty, very dirty. We had a contact, or they did, the agents had a contact in Denver at a bank who knew who I was. I was a federal agent. And we had it all set up to go in and uh, take the suitcase of money. There they counted it also. And uh, I did find that they were short on a few hundred dollars on the counting. So I made it legitimate. That's why he knew I'm not a cop. I don't care about money. I did care. You're shorting me a hundred dollars. He would reach back into his pocket and get his wallet and spot the hundred dollars to make it exactly five thousand dollars. These were five thousand dollars of one hundred dollar bills, fifty dollar bills, or twenty dollar bills in those denominations. So uh, I went in, we counted the money, I got a cashier's check, I gave it to him, and he wanted to celebrate. So we went back to his bar. He gave me a cognac, a big fancy bottle of cognac. He wants to celebrate. Of course, all the agents there and the uh, back where I had to go take the car back. They were celebrating because they thought, wow, we've got a money laundering count now. So we did well there. Uh, later on, uh, he was arrested. But here's a 26-year-old who was crying for attention. The worst thing you can do when you have those kind of monies is not uh, lie low. But he owned uh, two Spanish radio stations at the age of 26 from Mexico. He owned a bar, two houses, about seven or eight vehicles. He was crying for attention and he got their attention and that's where they brought me in. He landed up going away uh, for drug charges and money laundering for 18 years. And later on, I'll talk about the, the teeth that money laundering brought in when uh, uh, President Reagan passed those laws, signed them into law in 86 and 88. Thank you, Alan. Fascinating story. Mike, I wanna... Yeah, go ahead. Can I, can I uh, maybe talk to your uh, listeners relative to money laundering in Mexico? Because I think that they need to get an understanding of the cartels, the way they launder money. Let me start with uh, an operation that we did. And this took place in April of 2006. As the sun was setting, in Playa del Carmen in the southern Mexican state of Campeche. We were there with the Mexican military as a DC aircraft landed in Playa del Carmen. And we ended up seizing 5.1 uh, tons of cocaine. Wow. It was a big hit to be sure. But more importantly, we started to trace the paperwork on the purchase of the DC-9 aircraft with the Mexican government, with Alvin's uh, old 
agency, IRS, and we trace the money back to Wachovia Bank, the Mexican branch. And we come to find out that they were laundering money for the uh, uh, cartel, the Valle del Norte in Colombia and the Sinaloa cartel. And they had not applied money laundering scriptures to money that was being sent in by wire transfers, traveler's checks, and then cash deposits to the tune of three, $378.2 billion. The Sinaloa cartel was packaging packs of money that would fit perfectly underneath the teller's window. So criminal charges were filed, but later there was an agreement between Justice and Wachovia Bank, and they ended up paying $160 million in fines. The other bank that was laundering rivers of money was the biggest bank in Europe, which was HSBC. And they laundered tons of money for the cartels and they ended up paying a fine of, of $1.9 billion. The, the Setas, which is, was the most violent cartel in Mexico, these are the guys that would dismember, behead, and then pile up bodies in virtual uh, macabre uh, mountains of, of uh, corpses on the outskirts of, of, of uh, many cities. And we started an investigation which led to a horse ranch in the state of Oklahoma called Tremor Enterprises. And what they were doing is they were buying race horses. They purchased 400 of those race horses laundering tons of money, yet they were sending millions of dollars every month to that ranch to buy racehorses. As a matter of fact, one of their racehorses, Mr. Piloto, actually won the uh, futurity race in Rio Doso Downs, you know, to the, won a million dollars. I mean, this is how lucky they are. The other thing also is that the DEA worked with Mexico's Financial Intelligence Unit, which was formed in 2004. But last year, with in, in coordination with the Mexican government, we seized 2,000 bank accounts totaling, you know, over a billion dollars that belonged to the Jalisco New Generation Cartel headed by Nemesio Oseguera Cervantes. So money laundering is a very complex, very diversified situation. And the Mexican cartels are definitely the best in the world in terms of money laundering. Well, let me, I, let me ask you another question about money laundering. And Alvin, maybe I'll throw this to you. We know through things like the Panama Papers, we know, you know Deutsche Bank in, in Europe, for example, has been accused of you know, laundering a lot of Russian money. Uh, through lots of different channels, including potentially a certain uh, former president. How does this kind of money laundering work? Why, how is it not obvious? And, and do we need different tools at a global level? Because it's really a global issue and not just a United States or a Mexican issue. How do we get better at stopping this kind of, you know, money laundering activity at a, at a global level? And, and then obviously for, you know, for drug cartels in particular. I'll let Mike uh, kick in after I say something because I know he's got, but one of the things uh, back when I went to Washington DC in 1990, uh, we did not have, IRS criminal investigation did not have attache at the at US embassies uh, anywhere. So one of my best friends, Mike, Michael Yasowski, who later, later became a vice president for HSBC Bank out of Hong Kong, he was started the first under uh, attache. Took him about two years to get it going in Colombia, in Bogota, Colombia. Later on, the next one was Mexico City. And after that, they've gone to Europe now, Singapore, etc. But without those people out there at the IRS level, the criminal investigations level, so I was brought in several years ago to teach money laundering and 
financial investigations to the uh, judicial branch of, uh, of Colombia and the Colombian National Police. What happened there is you'd land up dead if uh, back in the Pablo Escobar days, they didn't investigate for 20 years because if you do, you're dead. So once they, once they straighten that thing out, now they don't know how they don't have any uh, intelligence, any, they have, they've lost their skill set if they ever had any. So that's why they brought me in. But it's relationships. I think it's the biggest thing is relationships and also understand that you're operating in corrupt countries. And uh, I think one of the things that I always uh, operated under is anyone can be bought. So, uh, I've had that debate with someone that says, she told me, no, I can't be bought. I've said, well, I don't think that they've hit their price yet, but every single person can be bought. If you go in with that premise, you're, it's a very, you're dealing in a very difficult environment. And I think what Mike Vigil comes in and he cultivates uh, informants that are in the inner sanctum. And that to me, that's the way that you get in into those organizations. And then we do have some agreements between countries, MLAP agreements between countries of cooperation. Uh, again, if they're corrupt, are they going to go around them? But Mike, why don't you add to that? Well, one of the things that the United States needs to do is they need to work in a very collaborative effort, especially with Latin American and Caribbean countries. We need to develop their infrastructure in terms of money laundering laws because a lot of their laws are very, very weak. Even here in the United States where we have strong money laundering laws, we have a big problem within treasury and a lot of the agencies that handle money laundering because they don't have enough personnel. So that is something that you know, precludes the United States of really doing a, a better job in terms of you know, making sure that we have anti-money laundering processes that we can actually enforce. But Alvin brings up a good point in terms of corruption. And that's another thing that we need to work on a collaborative effort with countries to make sure that we root out corruption because it does have an impact, especially when you have high level corrupt officials that don't want to pass or don't want to enforce anti-money laundering uh, laws. Well, let's, um, let's pull back the lens a little bit and go to uh, more of a 30,000 foot view. And Mike, I'm gonna stay with you on this because I know you've been following the story closely. Can you give us some of the, the big picture story of General Salvador Cuego Cepeda and what is important about his case, not only for the drug trade, but really for helping to shape in possibly a negative way, US-Mexico relations. Can you give us that story? Yes, uh, General Cienfuegos was the Secretary of Defense under the Peña Nieto administration from 2012 to 2018. Cienfuegos was a very controversial figure even then because the Mexican army, which has always been held up as a prestigious institution by the Mexican government, it's not. It's highly corrupt and has been corrupt since you know, the beginning of the 1980s. But General Cienfuegos and his army units were involved in massacres. For example, the Ayotzinapa students, the rural teachers students that were killed in Iguala Guerrero in 2014, you know, there's links and implications that the Mexican military was involved when Cienfuegos was the Secretary of Defense, but he covered it up. There was also another massacre in the Mexican, uh, in Mexico State in uh, Tlatlaya, where the Mexican army killed 22 individuals and then they 
try to distort the crime scene to make it look like there was a confrontation. But to make a long story short, the DEA started an investigation on a very violent drug trafficking network called H2 or H2, which was based in Tepic, Nayarit. And it was uh, formerly part of the Beltran Leyva organization. And after two years of wire intercept, uh, where communications were intercepted, Cienfuegos fell head first into the conspiracy. And he was protecting the operations of H2. And he was also involved in money laundering and then also involved in arranging for transportation for cocaine out of South America into Mexico. Cienfuegos was charged on four federal counts, one money laundering, and then the other ones were conspiracy to traffic methamphetamine, heroin, cocaine, and marijuana. Cienfuegos comes in with his family in October of last year to go to Disneyland. He lands at LAX and he's arrested there. He is removed from California to New York where he's going to face charges. And AMLO, the Mexican president, Lopez Obrador, comes out and says, well, this is a problem here in Mexico. Corruption is a problem. But then very quickly, he shifts his opinion and he starts to make efforts to bring Cienfuegos back. And his point man for that is Marcelo Ebran, who is the foreign minister. Ebran calls the former attorney general, William Barr, and says, look, if you don't return Cienfuegos, you know, there's going to be major consequences in terms of bilateral counter drug cooperation. Bill Barr, who doesn't understand anything about Mexico, puts out an order that they're going to return Cienfuegos back to his country. And I knew that when Cienfuegos was being removed to Mexico, that he would never be charged in Mexico, despite the assurances of the Mexican government that they were going to conduct an objective and impartial investigation. Cienfuegos goes back to Mexico as a free man, by the way, and the Mexican Attorney General's office conducts a two-month investigation, and there is no way that you're going to do a complex investigation in two months. And they come out and they say that there is no evidence against Cienfuegos, so they absolve him of all charges. The next thing you know is Lopez Obrador starts making public statements that the DEA fabricated the evidence against Cienfuegos. And the day after Cienfuegos arrest, I did at least 40 interviews with the Mexican media, US media, media from all over the world. And I told them the DEA does not fabricate evidence. I said, the DEA does the investigation and then the evidence is reviewed by a federal prosecutor. Then the federal prosecutor presents it to a grand jury and they will issue or not issue based on the evidence, an indictment. Then Lopez Obrador starts naming me in his press conferences. The last one, he said that I had reviewed the information provided by the US government to the Mexican government and that I had changed my mind. 
But one of the reporters present at his news conference immediately stood up and said, no, he has not changed his mind. But there's a lot of disinformation, Sandy, that is taking place in Mexico. Uh, Lopez Obrador says many, many things, but you know he's lying through his teeth and I've called him on it in, in the uh, media in Mexico because the lies are just absolutely outrageous. Now, Gertz Manero, Alejandro Gertz Manero, who's the attorney general of Mexico, has also come up and he said that, you know, we did a very shoddy investigation without rigor. And I responded to him and I said, within the DEA, we have about a 98% success rate in our prosecutions. Mexico has less than 5% success rate so who doesn't prosecute with rigor? So the United States sent about 551 pages of information to the Mexican government. They indicated that it was not sufficient, but the US did not provide all of the information, all of the evidence, because we know that that information could easily be leaked and will be leaked and was leaked by the Mexican government in violation of the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty of 1991. The Attorney General's office put out some documents on their investigation, but it was all redacted. You couldn't tell. So, you know, it's very highly suspicious. But Lopez Obrador, you know, basically amended Mexico's national security law. And they said that not only DEA, but all US agencies operating on Mexican soil had to number one, provide all information that they developed in Mexico to the Mexican government. Well, that's problematic because a lot of that information is sensitive and it can easily compromise the safety of agents, informants, and other investigations and operations that are ongoing. Secondly, they removed all diplomatic immunity from DEA agents operating in Mexico, which is a problem, especially when you're involved in an environment with massive violence being generated by the, uh, the cartels. And they also uh, included, you know, many other things. And they said that, you know, we could not go out and operate with the Mexican security forces. Well, DEA is responsible for most of Mexico's success story in any counter drug operation. And the, the Mexican security forces are pretty ill trained. So a lot of times we go out with them so that to ensure that they do the operation, you know, very appropriately. Well, sorry if I'm interrupting, but I, one of the, it's, it's hard not to take away one key thing from both of your comments this morning, which is really that with soft institutions, with the possibility of corruption, with everybody having their price, that inevitably these things will happen. Um, and so I guess that brings me back to AMLO. And what are AMLO's stakes in this? Why would he let Cienfuegos off the hook? Why, it, you know, are there, is the level of corruption right now in this current Mexican administration so high up that it would essentially uh, you know, demand that AMLO let Cienfuegos off the hook? Well, the thing is that corruption has always been very endemic in Mexico. And with AMLO, I think that AMLO didn't care when Cienfuegos was arrested, but there's a cobble of high-ranking military officials that did care and I highly suspect that they, some of them were involved with Cienfuegos 
in corruption and taking money from drug traffickers, but they pressured AMLO to try to secure Cienfuegos' release, which he did. Under AMLO, people have to understand that the security forces, especially the military, has even a more expanded role in Mexico. Right now, they're building the Mexico City Airport. They're involved in a COVID response. They're involved in immigration. They're involved in security. So AMLO, when he came into the presidency, you'll recall that he made a comment that he was going to put the military back into the barracks where they belonged. And to the contrary, he basically gave him a greater role. And the role that they play in terms of counter drug efforts is not a good idea because that precludes from Mexico doing police reform in that country, number one. And then secondly, they're ill-trained and ill-equipped to do counter-drug efforts because they're not investigators. They don't know how to recognize evidence. They don't know how, how to collect evidence. And a lot of the cases that they're involved in, you know, basically, uh, you know, fall by the wayside because they're not investigators. Well, okay, so three things. First of all, everyone out there, please type in your questions into the Q&A box and we'll get to them in a minute. We're gonna talk about the flow of weapons in a minute from the United States into uh, Mexico. But Alvin, let me throw, let's go back in a time machine to 1984. Tell us about what happened in 1984 under Ronald Reagan. And, uh, and, and the efforts that that created to stop or stem the flow of money laundering. Sure, uh, back in 84, the 80s, uh, let's go back to the 80s. Uh, Ronald Reagan becomes president 1981 through 89. Uh, back at the beginning of that period, the American people saw the biggest problem as uh, drugs abuse as about two to 4% of the American people thought in 1985, that's the biggest problem of the United States. 89, fast forward, all of a sudden, in four-year period, the drug abuse is seen as 60, by 65% of Americans, is seen as the biggest problem in the United States. So you see the growth of, especially crack cocaine at that time. You had powdered cocaine, then you had crack cocaine. Crack cocaine was devastating the African uh, uh uh, African-American communities, uh, also Hispanic communities, minorities, uh, and white also. But the fact is that uh, when Reagan comes in, he basically started, uh, wanted to reinforce the Nixon's fight against drugs. And with that, uh, he said, I want to really reinforce. And the big thing that came with this law, 1986, the uh, Money Laundering Act of 1986, and then the 19, followed closely by 1988, he's still president uh, during that period of time, is that for the first time, you could put someone in jail, that you, here in the United States, you could put them in jail uh, before they would come out like a turnstile, come out two or three years, the brother or the brother or the son or the wife would run the operations while he's cooling his heels and he steps back into his same shoes that he went in. Why? Because there was no, not, there was not such a thing as a criminal or civil forfeiture. You can seize the stuff, you can tie it into the operations, it's dirty money, and now you have the ability to take it, rip it off. When the individual comes out, he comes out barefoot. He no longer has an operation. Now, you got to give a lot of credit. Uh, Reagan uh, was very strong in that way. Uh, almost like uh, they said he was more of John Wayne than John Wayne himself. But he was a very uh, strong individual. You know, the wall came down uh, in Berlin and those kind of things. So he's very strong-minded. And without the forfeitures, 
uh, and also uh, they started going to jail for periods of if they were dealing with half a million dollars or more, for example, you were going away for close to 20 years, for 20 years in prison. Um, there's a sad human side to that. I was working down at the DEA task force in Las Cruces. They, uh, the individuals went and hustled a couple of young 18, 19 year olds out of the picking apples up in Yakima, Washington. They brought them in, they'll pay you $3,000 to take uh, methamphetamines, 800, 900 pounds in a boat. They're pulling a boat, it's in a hidden compartment to, to Chicago. And then when you get back with the truck, they'll give you three more thousand dollars. These guys were just low level mopes. We offered them a deal, 15 years in prison. They wouldn't take it because he had, his girlfriend had just had a little baby. We went to trial. He wouldn't take the 15 year deal. He's looking at his little baby and his girlfriend, 18, 19, 20 years old. He wouldn't take the deal, guilty, 25 years to 30 years in prison. His whole future was gone. Um, he'll never see his child. We found out that the person behind all this uh, was a doctor, a high level ranking medical doctor in Guadalajara, Mexico. Those are the people that have to, you've got to bring those down, not just the little low level people. The well, sad stories, human, human side. Totally. I, you know, I'm missing right now talking to Davey because Davey of course was an ATF officer at the border. He was also involved in the Waco, Texas uh, a shooting. Um, and he was going to speak about weapons, which is really the kind of third element that we really want to get into today. We have drugs arriving in Mexico for departure to the United States. We have money earned in the United States that needs to come back to Mexico. And really none of this happens without the weapons trade, moving weapons from the United States to Mexico. Mike, will you give us an overview of your thoughts of the weapons trade and of course the impact and influence of that trade in Mexico? Sure, and you hit the nail on the head, Sandy. You know, there's money, uh, drugs flowing north from Mexico, and then there's uh, illicit money and weapons flowing from the United States south into Mexico. Most 70% of all weapons that flow into Mexico come from the United States. And most of the weapons come from states that are on the southwest border with Mexico. Keep in mind that there's 732 gun stores along the Mexican border. And people go to gun shops, they go to gun shows, and they buy weapons. A lot of them are straw purchasers and they take those weapons very easily across into Mexico. Most of the weapons that flow from the Southwest border, 40% of them come from the state of Texas. And half of the weapons that go into Mexico are long weapons. So it is a problem because people don't realize that the Mexican cartels have become very paramilitary. You know, they wear uniforms. They, they take trucks and they put three inch steel plates on them and literally make them into tanks. They mount 50 caliber machine guns on trucks and the weapons are causing a major security problem in Mexico and during the course of, of the last several years, you know, uh, Mexico has lost hundreds of thousands of people to gun violence, cartel violence. So it is a very, very big problem. And Mexico has one gun store in the entire country. Wow. And it's in an army base located very close to Mexico City. It's guarded by the military. It's run by the military. It's called the Directorate of Arms and Munitions. They don't 
advertise. They would prefer that no one knows where they are. And they sell weapons, but it's very difficult to buy a weapon there because it's, they have very stringent requirements. You know, you have to show proof of citizenship. You have to show that you have a clean record. You have to show that, uh, you know, uh, that you live where you say you live, that you say, you know, that you are who you say you are. And they, you know, in 2000, they sold like 565 weapons. That was in 2000. Two years ago, they sold over 10,000 weapons. But the reason for the increase in the sales of, of weapons was because of the cartel violence that is taking place in Mexico. But it's very difficult for Mexico to have stringent laws governing weapons when you live next to a neighbor who has very lax laws, such as the United States. And you have, for example, other countries also that sell weapons to Mexico. The United States sells weapons to the armed services, to the police in Mexico. A lot of those include 50 caliber machine guns, rocket propelled grenades and what have you. And a lot of those weapons are diverted into the hands of the cartels, which makes them even more powerful. And I'm sure that you've seen videos of cartels going into towns and cities in Mexico without any interference from the security forces because they're outgunned and, and they're outnumbered. So just to make sure I've got you right, would you say, Mike, that alongside corruption at high levels in Mexican government, the, the US gun trade is essentially a key factor in, in ensuring the vitality of the drug trade and ensuring you know, the, the robustness of money laundering. You know, how would you say that guns or the import of guns to Mexico is just one of the most essential features for, for the drug industry to, to continue doing what it does? Yes, because the, the guns are very essential to the Mexican cartels because you know they're in a constant state of flux. Not only are they at war with other cartels, but they're also at war with the Mexican government. And the weapons allow them the power to intimidate the security forces and then also the population of Mexico. So weapons are a key factor and one of the things that we know, Sandy, is that drug trafficking and violence are hand in glove. You know, they, they go together. Well, it's time to go over some questions from the audience. And Alvin, let me throw this question to you. Um, did the Mexicans or Spanish speakers from farther south recognize your Northern New Mexico accent and vocabulary and slang and therefore have some suspicions about you? Yeah, uh, actually, that's uh, probably the, uh, as being as a novice uh, undercover agent at the beginning, uh, I was a little nervous about that. But you find out that uh, uh, as I got uh, and met Cubans, uh, Puerto Ricans, uh, even Spaniards, Venezuelans, uh, Colombians, Mexicans, everyone has uh, what I would say a dialect, uh, different uh, words mean different things for people. And so what I recognized later on in my undercover operations, it didn't matter uh, what, uh, that I spoke different because they all spoke different to me also. Um, so uh, it didn't present a problem at all. As a matter of fact, I used it to my benefit because once in a while, Keep in mind, I'm, 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 I'm recording. I had uh, two uh, speakers right here under my shirt, which they couldn't see. And, and uh, for most of the time I was recording uh, and I had a lot of agents around me in different rooms or in the hotel or in cars in the parking lot. 
I had a lot of people around me. My IRS mostly recorded everything. DEA, maybe they don't, but I'll tell you IRS. Everything was being recorded. Also, it was being trans transmitted. Uh, not only is it being recorded by me, but it's being transmitted to those people so they can hear what's going on. So a lot of times in, in, uh, in the value of evidence, would I would pretend that I didn't understand their words. <laughs> so I would explain to them, could you please uh, describe that? I don't understand the word. No entiendo su palabra. No tiene alguna otra palabra que me puede decir porque no entiendo. And the U.S. attorney uh, assistant was laughing. He said, I can't believe Alvin's having them explain it five different ways how he's going to launder his money. And and so they said, that you're, you take the cake. Because I used it to the benefit of getting indisputable evidence, basically, which made it a lot of fun, really. Well, and you must have some ice running in your veins to be able to <laughs> be in an environment with recording devices, knowing that one false step in, you know, in your life may be in jeopardy. And let me yeah, say well, something, let me say, a... some, let me say something about recording devices. You know, in the old days, they had nine, nine volt batteries, which would leak <laughs> and you'd be okay. negotiating and your skin was burning, but you couldn't flinch. <laughs> The, the, the problem with the, uh, the recordings is that a lot of times, you know, there's gaps in there, which the defense attorneys will, you know, take issue with in a court of law. So I never believe in you wearing wires because, you know, of, of the difficulties. And when you negotiated in an undercover capacity, it was always your word against the word of the drug trafficker and whose word was the jury going to take? Well, let me say two things to that. Um, one thing is you better be prepared because if you're going to be recorded video or audio, you, you, you cannot afford to make uh, strategic mistakes or evidentiary mistakes. For example, the individual that came in told my girlfriend she wanted, uh, he wanted, uh, he needed someone to take the money to Mexico. Uh, That's called predisposition. So when I went and she offered in my services, he was predisposed. He wanted somebody like me. Therefore, he can't, him and his attorneys cannot claim that I entrapped him. If not for Alvin Romero, the agent, my my uh, client would have never committed the crime. So the tapes were very good in that respect, but you cannot make mistakes because those mistakes, the defense attorney is gonna tear you up on the stand with those mistakes. So, you know, they have their positives and negatives. I can't imagine. Um... Great question here from Herb Thomas. Um, in an interview with Farid Zakaria a few weeks ago, Mexico's former foreign minister, Jorge Casañera, said that Lopez Obrador cooperated totally with President Trump's restrictive immigration policies, such as holding asylum seekers at Mexico's northern border, interdicting refugees and immigrants at the southern border, in exchange for the United States not objecting to anything AMLO did internally in Mexico. Mike, is that narrative accurate from where you sit? It is accurate, simply because Lopez Obrador was very subservient to Donald Trump's racist immigration policies. Now, Donald Trump would voice issues regarding counter drug efforts, but you know they were just words in the air. But what concerned Donald Trump is he wanted to isolate the United States and follow a political policy of isolationism. And he did not want people of color entering the United States. If you recall, when he entered the presidency, he would refer to Mexicans as murderers, rapists, and thieves. And then he wanted to build that racist wall, which serves no purpose because most drugs come into the United States through the ports of entry. And, you know, the immigrants that stay here, they come in on visas and overstay their visit. So AMLO 
started to stop the caravans at the border. They were living in 10 cities, no food, no medicine. So when Lopez Obrador was arrested, Donald Trump could have cared less about Mexico, but he did it as a favor to AMLO for his support in his racist immigration policies by returning Cienfuegos. So that is absolutely accurate. So one of the funny things of the World Wide Web is when you type in Mike V. Hill, up comes our organization as the first hit. And so I get requests almost on a weekly basis for, can you please connect me to Mike V. Hill? And these are producers with CNN and elsewhere. And of course, when there's big news in Mexico, uh, we get you know, a number of requests, please connect me to Mike V. Hill. So Mike, let's imagine that it's President Biden's office calling me for your contacts. Um, what are what would you advise Biden do, you know, given the legacy of Trump, given the legacy of racist immigration policy, the the border wall and so on? What should Biden's priorities be in restoring the U.S. American, sorry, the U.S. Mexican relationship? I think that, you know, uh, President Biden, you know, understands foreign diplomacy. So I think that the situation with Mexico is going to get better. But keep in mind that Biden's priority right now is COVID-19, you know, getting people back to work, getting the kids back to school. And then the other issues are restoring the alliances that Donald Trump uh, diminished or destroyed with a lot of our allies, especially in Europe. So he's got his plate full, but one of the things that I would recommend is that he works out a situation with Lopez Obrador, you know, for a more humane immigration policy, not move forward with the wall, but at the same time, maybe sit down with Lopez Obrador and craft another counter drug strategy that would be more viable because the cartels, they shift their strategies constantly and the counter drug strategy for the United States has been in place for decades. So there's a lot to be done in Mexico, but we also need to ensure that Mexico's institutions are developed. And that's one of the things that Biden has got to do, especially the judiciary, which is very weak. I mentioned that their success rate is less than 5%, which is almost the reverse of what we have here in the United States. The corrections uh, departments in Mexico are very poor, they're very weak, they're very corrupt. So there's many things that, that need to be done in Mexico. It's gonna take a lot of time. It's gonna take a lot of effort and probably a lot of funding to make sure that Mexico is up to standard in terms of combating uh, its major crises, which is the, uh, the Mexican drug cartels. Do they have the willpower? That's, a, that's probably the key question. They well, the thing, well the, thing is, the, the thing is that they have, uh, you know, a lot of people have the willpower, but the thing is that they need to put the proper people in the proper positions and make sure that these individuals hopefully would be vetted in terms of moving forward with a, lo a lot of the cause. There's people in Mexico that want to do the right thing, but there's still a lot of uh, corruption. One of the things that uh, Mike's talking about is I think that the Mexicans, uh, for example, and some of the other countries, they're entrenched. They're entrenched in the way they do things. You come in and introduce new ways of doing things. Uh, the crook evolves, the investigator and his and her techniques have to evolve also. Your strategies have to evolve. I think Mike says uh, they, uh, they're pretty much uh, anchored and they, they have to be prepared to move a little bit. Their laws are different. I, if I go to interview somebody in, in Colombia right now for a undercover, I mean, a, a, a criminal act of some sort, I have to send them a letter 
that they has to, he or she has to have a lawyer present before I meet with them. If I show up at the door and the, they told me the lawyer will be here and the lawyer is not there, I have to go home. Uh, there's no knock and talk surprise interviews uh, that are accepted as evidence in Colombia. So we got to deal, you got to remember you're dealing with it. I had to learn their laws in order to present my presentations of evidence and investigation. I had to go and spend weeks over there to learn their laws because if I taught them what we do in the United States, they'd laugh at me. So we used to have some laughs about that uh, during breaks and stuff like that. So it's different. You gotta, you gotta evolve. You gotta adapt. Well, that's a, a great segue into the next question, uh, and this is from our audience as well. And Michael, I'll throw this to you. You know, we know that the cartels are constantly moving inside Mexico, constantly gaining power, losing power, and then moving into different geographies. So there's a question here about San Miguel de Allende and how this has been a relative safe harbor for many years, uh, and yet now has increased cartel activity. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of the ways that cartels are constantly evolving within Mexico and just give us a little bit more of a picture of, of, uh, of this thing that's by far not a monolith? Well, the thing is that the, uh, the cartels had evolved significantly because in the uh, 1980s, there was only one cartel and that was the Guadalajara cartel. That was the only cartel that existed in that country. And they only trafficked marijuana and heroin and then they formed an unholy alliance with the Colombian cartels and they started to move the cocaine for the Colombian cartels. Now, well, after the demise of the leader of the Guadalajara cartel, an individual by the name of Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, in 1970, in, in 1989, uh, there was a meeting in Mexico City. A lot of people say it happened in Puerto Vallarta, but it happened in Mexico City, where very much like traditional organized crime here in the United States, they decided to divide the geography of Mexico. For example, the Tijuana area went to the Ariano Felix brothers. Juarez went to Amado Carrillo Fuentes, who is better known as the Lord of the Skies. The Gulf Cartel or on the Gulf side went to Juan Garcia Abrego. And then the Sinaloa Cartel went to Chapo Guzman and other individuals, but primarily Chapo Guzman. They started to then diversify their criminal portfolio. Instead of just cocaine, marijuana, heroin, they went into fentanyl and they went into the manufacture of methamphetamine and those two latter drugs are their biggest money makers. But now they have started to go into the lumber business. You know, they steal lumber. And then Pemex or Petroleos Mexicanos has pipelines all over Mexico. They have seven refineries throughout the country. And they've started to tap in to those pipelines and steal fuel. Not everybody uses drugs, but everybody uses fuel. And that has become a billion dollar enterprise for the Mexican cartels. And now in the state of Michoacan, they started to go into the $5 billion a year avocado industry. Most of the avocados that are consumed here in the United States come from the state of Michoacan. So they have become diversified they have become paramilitary. And the thing is that they are ultra, ultra violent. There's, you need a scorecard right now to keep track of all the organized crime units in Mexico, but make no mistake about it. The two supersized cartels are the Sinaloa cartel, and then also the Jalisco New Generation cartel headed by the Mesio Segueda Cervantes. Very good. Let me ask one final question of both of you, and it's the same question. I'll start with you, Alvin. Alvin, if AMLO invited you to his office to say, what's the one thing I should do to stop money laundering or to 
fight against the drug trade, what kind of advice would you offer the president of Mexico? Uh, resources. He needs trained resources. People, uh, IRS has for a long time sent people down there to train the uh, Hacienda, which is the Mexican treasury. And they send people out there for weeks at a time, maybe two weeks at a time, and you train them. But I think uh, what we know is that the training goes dead. It, they don't, they don't uh, build on it. They, it, uh, these people, they rotate other people the next time. What happened to those other people? They didn't become experts. They, they didn't build on it. They're doing, now they're a patrol officer now. They, you trained them, but they didn't use it. And that's the sad part. So they need to get long-term training and, and develop it. That, that would be my advice and be committed to it. Mike, same question to you. Yeah, the, 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 the big thing that AMLO needs to do is that, you know, they, they do very well in terms of money laundering. And there's a lot of agencies, U.S. agencies in Mexico that help him with that. The problem that Mexico has is not necessarily issues with money laundering. It's asset forfeiture. It's keeping those assets within the government once they're seized. And those laws are very, very weak. For example, we had the governor, uh, Mayo Villanueva, that had taken money from the cartels. He had ranches. We helped the Mexican government seize over $100 million in ranches, properties, and what have you from uh, Villanueva. And then several months later, th those resources were reverted back to him once his attorneys petitioned for the return of those resources. So it has to be asset, strong asset forfeiture laws. And this financial invest intelligence unit that was formed in 2004 is doing a pretty good job, but they have to be able to maintain those assets once they're seized. Well, gentlemen, thank you both so much. What a fantastic overview of a really complicated problem. Alvin Romero, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning. We're deeply grateful. Thank you. And uh, Mike Vigil, as always, thank you so much. You are an absolute authority on all things uh, US-Mexico. And uh, again, thanks for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Oh, we enjoyed, uh, you know, uh, being with the uh, Santa Fe Council. And let me kick it back to you, Sandy. You do an incredible job. And the thing is that uh, I, I find it very enlightening that you enlighten people in New Mexico in terms of so many subjects uh, that are global in nature. Thank you, Mike. Most appreciated. And it's a, it's a great pleasure. We have so many fun conversations and there's so much to talk about uh, these days. So again, thank you both very much. And uh, for all of you out there, thank you for joining us today. I would love to see you Tuesday, Wednesday, and or Thursday of next week. We have some great streams coming up. Uh, and until then, we'll see you later. Bye-bye.